Uh, if you don't mind standing with me, I'm going to read starting in verse 17, and I'm going to work, work down to the end of the chapter, reading verse 17 just for context. This is God's word. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord." Join me in a brief word of prayer. Father, we are asking now for your help as we open up your word. Lord, there is so much that you are saying in this passage. And Father, we won't be able to unpack every word, but Lord, we want to get the heart of it. We want to get to the point of it. And Lord, we want to be changed by it. I pray that you would visit us today as you already have been here. Now visit us by your spirit that we might hear what he has to say to us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to believe. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. If you're taking notes, uh, the title of this sermon is The Unimpressive Gospel. The Unimpressive Gospel. Several years ago, my family and I were blessed with the, a good deal on a house in the heart of Wilmington. Uh, the house was listed as a, a short sale, uh, which among other things means that the house is being sold as is, and that any repairs that have to be made are the responsibility of the buyer. And so that being the case, we thought it would be wise to uh, have inspectors come to the house and inspect it. And a number of folks came to the house and spent a good deal of time combing the property, uh, making note of all of the little things that we should repair, many of them being cosmetic. But the, the things that we really wanted them to check were the issues that we couldn't see with our eyes. We wanted them to check the integrity of the house. And so we had inspectors check the foundation. We had inspectors check the roof. We had them check the wood framing for signs of termites. We didn't want any surprises that would prove to be very costly later. Now, like a diligent home inspector, as we saw last week, Paul is closely examining the church in Corinth after hearing a, an unfavorable report from Chloe's household. And Paul is concerned not so much with the cosmetic appearance of the church, not so much with the externals, but with the internal integrity of the church. And he's concerned because like termites in a home's framework, worldly philosophies have infiltrated this church 
philosophies that threatened to undermine the very message that made them a church in the first place. And Paul knows that if these philosophies are allowed to remain, they could potentially destroy the house. So in our text today, Paul writes to refute these worldly philosophies. In fact, he's doing that for these first four chapters. And he will go through pains to show how compared to man's wisdom, God's wisdom, God's way of saving men and women and boys and girls, God's plan to reconcile them in his sight, to to make them right with him, may appear foolish in the sight of the world. But as Paul is going to repeatedly show these Corinthians and us, only a crucified Christ in the gospel has the power to both guard this church and our church from our culture's influence over us and to save us in the final day. Dear church, you'll probably hear me say this many times in the next few weeks, the implications of these opening chapters could not be more important for us right now. Again, the the cultural influences of Paul's day may have looked different, but though they had a, a different face, these influences threaten to undermine the message of the gospel here at Grace City Church as well. And one of the most significant ways that the God of this age, that is the devil, holds in his grip this culture is by persuading it to be concerned with what? With externals, with cosmetics, with surfacey issues. The enemy does not want people to think too deeply about heart level issues. He doesn't want us to think too deeply about the state of our souls. He doesn't want us to investigate when our hearts are stirred at the preaching of God's Word. He doesn't want us to ask the big questions, questions like, how can I be made right with God? And so what do we have here in the West? We have a culture of self-reliance. We we live in a culture that has a DIY perspective. Paul shows, however, that externals, Self-reliance can never, ever bring a man or a woman into a relationship with God. Christ, Jesus, is the only path. And this is the message that he's preaching. This is why he preaches what to the world is a very unimpressive message, an unimpressive gospel. But only the gospel, dear friends, has the power to dismantle the external self-reliance that we are tempted to and to preserve us in the face of destructive cultural influences. So as we look at this text, it's broken down into two paragraphs. I'm going to put those into two headings. More broadly, we're going to first look at the unimpressive message, the unimpressive message. Then we're going to zoom in on an example of how this message changes lives as we look at the unimpressive members of the church at Corinth. The unimpressive message and the unimpressive members. If you're with me, say amen. Verses 18 to 25, the unimpressive message. Now in these first four chapters, there's there's going to be a word that is used repeatedly, and I want to talk about it here at the outset. And it's this word, wisdom. And in particular, in verse 20, there's, Paul is referring to a certain kind of wisdom that he calls the wisdom of the world. 26 times in these few chapters, he's going to use some version of this word wisdom in the Greek is Sophia. But it's important to know what he means when he uses this word, because he doesn't use the term wisdom in the sense that we are used to here in the modern West in, with the word wisdom, the know, knowing of the meaning of the word wisdom. Today, uh, wisdom sort of means like good sense. You know, it, it's a person that has 
good smarts. We, we consider a person wise when they have a, a good head on their shoulders and they exercise sound tuition and insight in decision making. In Paul's day, Sophia or wisdom was something a little different. Wisdom was man's attempt to make sense of life and death, for example, through one's own knowledge and experience. To have wisdom was to have a, a coherent worldview. To have wisdom was to be able to articulate what you believed about the world and about life and about death and why. And the people who could do that were the ones who led the TED Talks of the day. They were the ones who stood before the crowds and explained about their impressive uh, worldly system of knowledge, the way that they had it all figured out. Those were the celebrities of that day. And among these people who claimed that their philosophical system made the best sense of life, there were, according to Paul, two general groups that he divides up, interestingly, by ethnicity. He says it there in verse 22, Jews and Greeks, Jews and Greeks. These two groups represent, if you like, two ways of doing religion, two ways of explaining God, which Paul will actually refute, actually don't get you to God at all. So let's look at these. First, there were the Jews. Now, of course, Paul was a Jew. The Jews were the people whose origin we learned about when we just studied the, the book of Genesis. Uh, Jews were really the first significant monotheistic group in the world. That is, they claim that there was only one God. And Paul says here that Jews have a characteristic about them. He says Jews demand signs. Now, why is that? Well, just a, a quick brief recap in our minds of Jewish history, throughout their being a people, God often worked powerfully among the Jewish people through signs and wonders and weather phenomena and plagues and all different miraculous things. And he freed them from their bondage to slavery through great power, through miraculous means. And so by the time that Jesus the Messiah came along, they had been waiting so long for God to deliver them from now Roman oppression. So it made sense in their mind that he would do it in the way that he always had. That God would set them free just as he did when he set them free from Egypt. Through great might and signs and wonders. And that's why when this little guy from Nazareth called Jesus gets up and starts performing miracles... Who was it that kept asking them to perform signs and wonders? It was the religious leaders, those who were in charge of teaching the people. You see, the religious leaders had in their minds their Messiah pegged. They knew that he was going to come in great strength. And so they asked for signs, not so that they could believe in him, but so that they could evaluate him to ensure that he fit inside their savior box, their messianic box, which of course he did not. God had ordained that their deliverance would come through the death of the Messiah. Of course, there were some people in Jerusalem and in Israel who genuinely hoped that Jesus was the Messiah and genuinely believed that they did, he, he was, because they were at the end of their rope. But Don Carson says in The Cross and Christian Ministry, there is a kind of longing for a display of Jesus' power that is entirely godly, submissive, perhaps even desperate. But he goes on, there is another kind that puts the person making the request in the driver's seat. Some want to see Jesus perform a sign so they can evaluate him, assess his claims, test his credentials. But as long as people are assessing him, as long as they are demanding signs, Carson says, Jesus, if he constantly acquiesces, is nothing more than a clever performer. Thus, the demand for signs becomes the prototype of every condition human beings raise as a barrier 
to being open to God. Now let's bring this into our modern day. In our modern day, those who demand signs may not be Jewish ethnically. They're the people who say, if you're God, then prove it. Crowd. They're the ones who who constantly lay at Jesus' feet conditions for coming to him. They say, I'll follow Jesus if he does such and such a thing. I'll follow Jesus if he fixes my marriage. I'll follow Jesus if he makes me wealthy and prosperous. I'll follow Jesus if he saves my children too. I'll follow Jesus if he takes away my illness. So much of our present day society, friends, falls into this crowd. So many in the West demand a God that meets needs and only then will they believe in Him. These are those who demand signs. So the natural question for us is, are we in that group? Do we say that we will only follow Jesus if? Then, of course, there were the Greeks. A Greek was any non-Jew, of course. If you're not Jewish ethnically here, you are a Greek or a Gentile. Paul says that, uh, of course, we know, excuse me, we know that the Greeks were those who were at the head, the advancement of technology in the world. Whether we realize it or not, so many of the things that we enjoy today are because of advancements in ancient Greek philosophy and math and science and so It's no wonder that Paul says Greeks seek wisdom. This crowd is not looking for the miraculous per se. This crowd wants a God who can be explained. They want a God who fits into a well-ordered theological box. This is what we might call the intellectual crowd. We might call this the evidence crowd. And for this crowd, unless God can be explained by facts and figures, he's not worthy of my trust. Richard Dawkins, the the famous atheist and evolutionary biologist, wrote in his book, The God Delusion, if all the evidence in the universe turned in favor of creationism, I would be the first to admit it and I would immediately change my mind. His argument, of course, is precisely the problem. Greeks demand a God that is explainable only by mountains of evidence. Friends, I want to tell you something. If that's your God, then that's not a God worth following. A God that we can stand over and put our finger on and say, I know exactly what he is all about, is a little God. It's not a God worth following. It's one we stand over. It's one who ought to follow us. And friends, this is not the God of the Bible. Now, ethnic distinctions aside, what is at stake here? What what happens when humanity tries to do religion, to try to come up with a pathway to God apart from the way that he has shown. Well, it's here that we begin to see that a person's ethnicity has nothing to do with God's saving plan. In the sight of heaven, Paul says that there are really only two kinds of people. And he tells us what those people are, who those people are in verse 18. He says that there are those who are being saved and there are those who are perishing. That's it. Paul says that when we lay prerequisites before God that he must fulfill, 
or develop personal philosophies about God that feel good in our heart but are weak to offer us the kind of abundant life that God offers us in His Word. Friends, whether we see it or not, we are on the road to eternal death. There's only one place that that road ends when we try to get to God through any other means than the means that He has provided for us. Paul says, by the way, that this has always been God's plan. Look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. The reason why Paul quotes Isaiah 29, 14 in verse 19 and later on Jeremiah 9, 23 in the last verse, verse 31, is he's, because he's trying to say, hey guys, listen, this has always been God's plan. As far back as the Old Testament, Paul is saying, this has always been God's plan. Alistair Begg says, it has always been in accordance with God's plan that there would be no intellectual road to God. Of course, that doesn't mean that he doesn't use logic and reason and miracles. But friends, those are only means. Those are not what saves. Do you remember the rich man and Lazarus? Remember Lazarus died and went into the presence of God and the rich man died and he went into Hades and he was burning in the flame and he called Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, please go tell my brothers about the truth. Please go tell my brothers about the only way to God. And Lazarus said, what do you want me to do? Even if I were to come back from the dead, they would not believe. Friends, the God of the Bible does not fit inside our little religious boxes. Those who demand signs cannot reconcile the fact of a Messiah who was cursed by God by hanging on a tree in weakness for their sins. That's the opposite of power. And those who demand explanation, that, who makes no logical sense of a God who would save the world through a crucified man, when humans have all the answers, that's makes no sense, and that's the opposite of wisdom. The true God, described in the Bible, has always purposed to bring life and blessing to people through the message of a crucified Christ, irrespective of their ethnicity, their age, their gender, their social status. The only way into life is that God himself turns over our natural-born self-reliance and calls us to himself through the raw preaching of the gospel message. Verse 24, but to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. One of the conditions that Michelle and I had when we bought our house was that we convert this little one-car garage that we had into an office for me. And I'm a little handy, very little bit, very little handy. And so I had this very brief moment where I thought about doing the work myself. And that maybe I would call on somebody later on if I got into a bind, but I wanted to save a few bucks. So I went into the garage and I stood there with my little pencil and my little paper and my little tape measure. And I decided I'm going to try to figure out how a room would appear here. And so I imagined this room. And I stood there and it probably lasted about five minutes. And as I stood there, I began to realize I... I can't do drywall. I've never actually hung a window in the side of a house before. I'm not real sure how I'd run electricity from way over there to get me some light here. And then none of it would be done, done to code, and so we probably could count this as square footage later on. And so 
I stood there with my little tape measure and my little pencil, and I felt that big. And I said aloud, I can't do this. If this dead space is ever going to become living space, then someone else is going to have to do the whole thing. Dear ones, God has so ordered our salvation so as to bring an end to human self-sufficiency. No strength derived from self. No explanation formed in the human mind. No determination to be the best that we can be will ever make us right in the sight of God, ever. All we can do, friends, is to stand there in His presence and feel small and confess out loud, I can't do this. If you are going to transform this dead space into living space, then you, Lord, are going to have to do the whole thing. Grace City Church, in hearing the gospel message preached here Sunday after Sunday, I want to ask all of us the question, and myself included, are we still relying on ourselves What are the barriers that are still hindering us from being open to God? Are we so puffed up with ourselves that Christ crucified for us has become only words? Or if we are Christ followers, has the cross strayed from its central focus in our life And we've reverted to trying to rely on our own strength, our own wisdom to get us through life, dealing with that people problem or that money problem or that child problem or that depression or that discontentment with a can-do attitude. Friends, everything God does in our lives, everything that He does is to prove to us over and over and over again that our very lives are owed to what He has done for us. That's the message of the Bible. That's the gospel. Peter said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. In Christ, friends, God has brought an end to our self-sufficiency. We can't do this. He did the whole thing. That's the unimpressive nature of the gospel message. It takes us, takes it out of our hands completely. All we can do is open our hands and say, I can't do this. You have to do the whole thing. Now Paul is going to give an example of how this message works itself out in the lives of some very unimpressive people. So point number two, the unimpressive members. That is of the church in Corinth. So Paul, in essence, says if, if, if any of you Corinthians need proof of the gospel's power, you need no further proof than to look in your collective mirror. Verse 26, he says, Consider, my brothers, what you were when you were called by God. Okay, so what's Paul doing? Paul is is doing what you and I must do as we think about the, the circumstances and the conflicts and the situations of our lives. He is applying the gospel to them. Paul wants his church family, to think about the fact that before God called them to himself through the, humanly speaking, unimpressive message of Christ and him crucified, that they themselves weren't very impressive by what we might call human standards. Do you remember in in high school when you were a senior, you had to vote on the senior superlatives? They, they gave you all these categories that you, you had to pick from, and you had to work through your mind who in your class was the, the biggest flirt and the, the, the most likely to be married next week and the most likely to become president and the most likely to win the, the Nobel Prize. And, 
So we were asked to evaluate, and in case, most cases strictly by outward appearance, the likelihood that this guy or this gal was going to do the best in this particular category. Now, it might surprise you I was not nominated for any of those categories. But that's okay. Because Paul says that if we had a superlative contest in the church at Corinth, or any church for that matter, and we were to judge by human standards who among us would be most likely to become Christian if we could rewind time by about 20 years, very few of you would be nominated. Why? Well, because if we took the whole bunch and we took an account of all of us who, who came from solid stock, people known to be among the best and the brightest minds, those who were morally and ethically good people, those who were born into prominent families, very few of us, Paul says, could actually raise our hands. In fact, let's be honest, none of us hardly could raise our hands. If, if, if the, the church with the most famous, the most good-looking, the most beautiful, the wealthy. Have you noticed that those churches today, the church with the most well-to-do and the most intellectual and the wealthiest, have you noticed something about many of those churches? They tend to be very dead spiritually. Why? Well, because by and large, these are the prove it and explain it people. The ones who have achieved great personal success through their own wit and wisdom. The ones who are most self-reliant. Now, before you get mad at me, is Paul saying that God is not in the business of saving the well-to-do? Certainly not. God saves the prominent as well as the poor. What he is saying, however, is that in God's economy, his modus operandi, his way of doing things in the world is to call people who have nothing to rely on for their salvation. Jesus said just as much. Remember when he said how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Why, because God can't save rich people? No. Because the rich have whatever they need to get from one day to the next. They don't need, by and large, a Savior because they have their God to rely on. Friends, God has always ordained for salvation, our salvation, to fly in the face of human snobbery. He has always intended for our salvation to offend our middle-class sensibilities. He's always intended throughout all salvation history to show up human wisdom those who attempt to make sense of our world with his higher and his better way of doing things. And he's done it all really for one reason. You know what that is? Listen again to verses 27 and following. For God chose what is foolish to shame the wise, what is weak to shame the strong. God chose what is low, even things that are not, to bring about nothing, those things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God. That's the ultimate intent of the gospel. The ultimate intent of the gospel is to shut down those merely human ways that appear to have substance so that when men and women come simply with nothing in their hands, there'd be nothing left to rely on except Christ himself. The gospel crushes our self-confidence. The gospel tells us that we owe our entire existence not to the person who witnessed to us, not to our pastors, not to our parents, not to our experiences, even though God uses all of those things as means, but to the activity of God through Jesus Christ. That's why he says in verse 30, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, the wisdom of God. That is, as it's best translated, 
our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, all synonyms that describe the change that God is working in us by His Holy Spirit. This past week, Aaron and I were talking about the sermon as we we often had the chance to do, and I'm grateful for that. And as we were talking, he reminded me of this obscure little story in the Old Testament found in 2 Samuel chapter 9 about King David. After King David ascended to the throne of Israel, David inquired of his servants to reach out into the house of Saul, who was the former king, to find just someone else that he could show kindness to for the sake of Saul's son, Jonathan, who David had a special relationship, friendship with, and Jonathan had died recently in battle. And so it was told to David that Jonathan had one more son, and he was a a guy by the name of Mephibosheth, no one names their kids that these days, who we're told couldn't walk. He was permanently crippled in his feet. David said, go and get me Mephibosheth. Bring him to my palace. Mephibosheth very likely believed that he was being summoned there to lose his head. Back in those days when a new king would take power, they would get rid of all competition by eliminating the family of the former king that was there. Mephibosheth no doubt thought that he was going to his death because, after all, he was Saul's grandson. But that's not what happened. Put it on the screen for you. Listen to what happened. Verse 7, But David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? As I said, this is a an obscure little story, but friends, this is a beautiful depiction of the love that God has for his people. Mephibosheth was the very last person that a king would ever choose to have seated at his table. On the outside, he had nothing to offer. On the outside, he was totally disabled. On the outside, all Mephibosheth could do was receive, for goodness sakes, he had to be carried everywhere. And yet, the king summoned him everywhere, anyway. And for the rest of his life, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table, despite the fact that he remained lame. But every time he was carried in, he would look down at his legs And he would be amazed that the king noticed such a dead dog as him. Now, dear ones, in the same way, Paul wants us readers to take a break from all the things we're distracted by, to take a break from bickering and infighting, to take a break from trying to be right, to take a break from judging, and at home with our children, with our spouse, to take a break and consider our own calling. We are all Mephibosheth. By human standards, we are nobodies. Grace City Church, by human standards, in the eyes of the world, we are nobodies. But listen, God chooses nobodies so that when they are carried into the presence of the supreme somebody, they would never, ever, ever stop being amazed that God would choose such a dead dog to eat at His table forever. I wonder, among my brothers and sisters here today, are there some among us who are still relying on our own impressiveness? our own wisdom, our own attempts to make sense of our lives apart from Jesus. 
Every day we're alive in this culture, we are being persuaded by demonic powers at work in our culture to look away from Him to things that sparkle, to things that are beautiful, to things that make sense, to things that are logical, to things that make us feel better about ourselves. When deep down spiritually, where it counts, friends, we are Mephibosheth. We, apart from God's grace in Christ, are disabled. If this is you, believe me, I sit there right there with you. Friends, what if today, as we in just a moment partake of the Lord's Supper, we did what Paul tells his readers to do. Consider your calling, dear brothers and sisters. We may have a lot of fine qualities that make us good people. But I want to say to you real quickly, no matter how handsome Mephibosheth was, he remained a cripple for the rest of his life until the day he died. That story ends. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. We are the spiritually disabled loved ones. But friends, in God's economy, it's actually our deficiencies that make us eligible for His grace. It's our deficiencies, not the fact that we're smarter or more outgoing or richer or we have a lot of spiritual gifts or we're naturally great parents and great friends. And yet, and yet, even after God saves us, so often He doesn't take away our deficiencies. You know why? It's so that when anyone does any boasting, when anybody puts their confidence in anything, it's not in ourselves. It's in the Lord. Aaron, would you come and lead us in the Lord's Supper?